On today's Locked On Texans, we revisit the Damian Pierce discussion. Lovey Smith has some interesting comments from Monday's press conference, and we take a look at the 2022 Texan draft class. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to a Tuesday edition of the Locked On Texan Podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm John Hickman, joined by none other than Cody Davis. Today's episode of Locked On Texans is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Listen, you can pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projections, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match. Up to one hundred dollars with promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com. Promo code locked on. Cody, what's going on, man? Just trying to listen, read of everybody reacting to Lovey Smith on whether or not he made the right decision. And ladies and gentlemen, from the fans to the reporters. To, to the people that just like to just dip their toe in Houston Texans news and coverage, it's okay. Because at the end of the day, nobody expected this team to be a playoff team anyways. So why are we bickering back and forth? Like Lovey Smith said on Monday, there was a lot of promise that came out of that game. Yes, the collapse was terrible. Yes, it was disappointing to end that game in the tie. But at the end of the day, there was a lot of promise and a lot of hope. And let's move forward and focus on that. Wow, Cody is such a company man. But you know, wow, the, said, the disrespect. He is a company man, and I you got to respect that. I mean, we are talking about the Houston Texans. This is a team that you are a credential reporter for. You know, so I understand it. But one thing wow. about it is, here on this show, <laughs> we're gonna keep it real. Uh, I thought Levy Smith said some interesting things in his press conference. Uh, one of which was he was asked about. The interior pass for us, he said he felt okay yesterday. And again, guys, this press conference is from Monday. So he said that I felt okay yesterday. What did we have? Three sacks? Question mark. Later in the game, we didn't get the type of pressure we needed to get. Simple as that. For me to talk about anything good that we did at any of the positions, coaching players, we didn't do our best job late. All right, he continued with. When you have a lead and the opponent is passing the football, that's when you need that pressure, whether it's be whether it be from blitz, four man rush, we rely on our four man rush an awful lot, so it needs to be better. Uh, I one hundred percent agree. I thought that early in the game, everything just seemed to go in the Texans' favor, hence the twenty to three lead uh heading into the fourth quarter. And then when they had more opportunities, and I think that when the game plan kind of opened up for the coach it just seemed like they started to unravel down the stretch now again with lovey smith saying that on sunday at the press conference he immediately acknowledged that the defense was drained and they were tired so it was a reason why they were playing like that they didn't get a break on the field um i wanted to see more out of jonathan gunnar for four quarters not the first two or three quarters uh, but everybody else did kind of tell off the interior defensive line, there's a a video of me on Twitter praising Roy Lopez. Um, he played the game uh, on Sunday pretty good. Malik Collins had a pretty good game on Sunday as well. Uh, but he's right. When it got down to when they were trying to make a comeback and towards the end of the game, the interior defensive line, but the entire defensive line didn't do a good job of creating pressure. Well, you keep talking about, you know, that the, the fourth quarter. Let's be real. Like, like I mentioned on yesterday, this is a team, a defensive team that gave up 200 and something yards. Everyone already, already know that. But at the end of the day, the only thing I did not like about that statement, and even the statement that you just made, John, is the fact that at the end of the day, it all boils down to the Texans offense not being able to sustain drive. And, and John, listeners and viewers, I truly believe had the Houston Texans 
did not get conservative in their play calling. Had the Houston Texans go out there and not put together a fourth quarter where we looked up at one point and you only recorded five yards in your first three possessions because it went fumble, punt, punt. There's no way in the world we're sitting here talking about this today. And John, as I alluded to on yesterday, as I've been saying, what, about 12 out of the 17 games last year, at the end of the day, these players are human. And if your defense is constantly on the field, eventually they're going to get tired. And what you saw in those first three quarters is not going to translate in the fourth quarter when it's most important. I do want to mention that um, Ogbo Okoronkwo had several moments throughout Sunday's game where as a defensive end, he just failed to keep outside containment. That was something that I wanted to mention on uh, Monday show, I had it in my notes and didn't get an opportunity to say so. Uh, that is something that in terms of coaching, uh, just coach them up and, and let's get better. There was the bootleg play action where Matt Ryan, and I forgot when this happened in the, in, in, in the game, but I believe this was in the second quarter, I mean the second half, but there was a bootleg play action where Matt Ryan came, you know, booted out and – Oka Wonko just crashed in and, and said, screw the assignment of keeping outside mm -hmm. containment. And that allowed Matt Ryan to boot out. And I want to say he hit Pittman right in between the linebacker and safety, like a deep drag, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. That was moments throughout the game defensively where you just cannot have guys miss gap assignment that bad. Uh, Levy Smith also talked about Kenyon Green. They asked him. What did you see out of Kenyon Green on Sunday? He can he answered that question by saying, well, what we saw was improvement as he played. He did some good things yesterday. We've gotten that first game out of the way with him, too. Kenyon is going to make play. He's going to play more and more. We don't go into the starting lineups this early in the week, of course. I like <clears throat> a lot of things that he did on, on Sunday. I 100% agree. This is his second game as an NFL player. And uh, he came in off the bench just like he did against the 49ers. He did some good things in a run. Pass protection is going to be the area of concern. And I think sometimes he may struggle with assignment with the pass protection. But overall, these are things that you are, as a coach, you're kind of happy to hear. Okay, well, he is pretty good in one area. Now I have the ability to be a coach and coach him up in this, in this area where we can get him better. I wonder – how much Keon Green, the more offensive snaps Coach Lovey Smith gives him, I wonder would that ultimately transition into Damian Pierce getting more snaps? And I only say that because as of right that's now, that's very and, interesting. Yeah, and, and I only say that because as of right now, look, I understand he's a rookie, but I truly do believe that Keon Green has the potential to be this team's best run blocker. And we and we and we could go back to the preseason game against the San Francisco 49ers where you saw that offensive line take a tremendous step forward in their run blocking in the run game in general when he was out there on the field and I thought about this John because as of right now if you don't mind if I do so Keon Green played only 38 snaps during yesterday's tie against the Indianapolis Colts while Damian Pierce played 20. And that caught my eye because I was going back to the conversation that you and I had as to why Wes Burkhead got more playing time and was favorable, favored in that game against the Indianapolis Colts over Damian Pierce. And you talked about you believe how it's more so how the game was structured, that you can do more with Rex Burkhead at this stage in his career versus Damian Pierce. And when I take a look at this rookie duo between Green and Pierce, I'm looking at this from a standpoint. Green has already showcased the potential to help this team out in the run with their run blocking that's going to help the offensive line get to that second to third level. And of course, we already know what to expect out of Damian Pierce. And I'm looking at this from a standpoint. And John, I know you're going to talk about it next, but with Coach Lovey Smith saying that, you know, he's going to give Damian Pierce more touches that it could definitely mean that Keon Green is going to get more touches on the field as well absolutely and I'm glad you brought it up because um Levy Smith on on Monday did mention that the game plan going into the Colts game was to see more of Damian Pierce however the flow of the game didn't allow that to happen and there was more passing downs 
that more than what he maybe have expected, which is why Rex Burkhead was out there. He was also, you know, asked about would he get more touches, Damian Pierce? Would Damian Pierce get more touches? And what about his pass blocking and receiving? Is that something that you want to see improvement of from Damian Pierce? And Lovey Smith answered it, I, I think, maybe the best way possible. And this kind of goes back to what I mentioned on yesterday. He said that it would be nice to see all of those sometimes – when you uh, excuse me, sometimes though, when you look back, you can't defend the amount of reps our starting tailback got in some of those situations. I wish he had gotten more. That's, I think that's positive, and we're going to make sure that we get him more of those opportunities. But a young back is some of those. Uh, he, he said that as a young back is some of those things. I wouldn't say that just being a primary bar ca- ball carrier is holding him back. Those are some things that we are going to have to make sure that we work on in situations that it doesn't happen again. And so I do believe that pass blocking is a area of m- many concern. I just think it's assignments for Damian Pierce. Uh, I-, I think that he is a good pass blocker as a running back, you know, stepping up in the pocket and making a play as a blocker. I think right now what the issue is, is maybe he doesn't know when to uh, step back or maybe just you know there's an assignment issue that he's still trying to learn at the nfl level not a bad thing but i do believe that that's why we saw um less of damian pierce which is why a lot of fantasy owners are pissed off (laughs) because uh they didn't get the opportunity (laughs) to uh get any good value and points from i saw a lot of people starting damian pierce in the fantasy league and i thought that was kind of odd he was not a star not yet, not week one starter. So well, look at the hype that was leading into this first game. Everybody hype, was hyping up his name. Yeah, you're yeah. right, but it ain't his fault that he died down. And today's episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy, and I'm pretty sure Prize Picks wouldn't have told you to start Damian Pierce. But you can pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projections, you can win up to ten times. Your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. You do not want to miss out on this fun and this excitement and this. It's just price picks is just new and fun, man. So again, check out pricepicks.com. Use promo code locked on for all of the fun, all of the fantasy, all of the time. Welcome back in Locked On Texans listeners and viewers out there. I wanted to give you guys some important information. I think some good stats to know about the snap count. Philip Dorsett only played in four snaps. Uh, there was – I saw a lot of people wondering whether or not, you know, it's going to be O.J. Howard and um, Farrell Brown and Brevin Jordan is going to be tossed to the side. I don't think so, ladies and gentlemen. Farrell Brown played 46 snaps. Brevin Jordan played in 42 O.J. Howard appeared in 12. Now, I do suspect that we will see more of O.J. (laughs) Howard, two (laughs) touchdowns and 12 snaps, Um, and and we should. Brevin Jordan, I think, did some pretty good things for Houston offensively. Didn't get featured in the passing game, but there were some things that I believe opened up the offense for other guys to work out. Your boy, Cody, Chris Conley, 10 snaps. Oh, hell no. It should be no sense. His name shouldn't even be on the roster. Yeah. 10 snaps for Chris Conley, 34 for Chris Moore. And I wanted to mention those last two, the wide receivers. And, of course, I'm going to include uh, Philip Dorsett into that. And Nico Collins had played in 47 snaps for the Houston Texans on Sunday. Interesting enough, I do think one issue that nobody talked about much, we haven't talked about at least here, is Davis Mills really has to stop favoring Brandon Cooks as if he's the only weapon out there. Now, on Sunday, Brandon Cooks did record seven catches for 82 yards, but he had 12 targets. The next highest target, guess who? Chris Moore. Rex Burkhead with eight. After Rex (laughs) Burkhead, it goes down to Chris Moore with three, Nico Collins with three, two for O.J. Howard, two for Brevin Jordan, two for Chris Conley. One for Philip Dorsett. I think that's inexcusable, uh, and I believe that that is an area that Davis Mills should be able to work on. By the way, on that pass to Nico Collins that I believe was 18 yards, a half a second later, maybe not even a half a second if, you're, if your quarterback can put it out there on time, 
Chris Moore would have been walking in uh, for a touchdown. Cody, want to talk about Jalen Petrie and Derek Stingley? Good day yeah. for the rookies on, on Sunday. But clearly, Lovey Smith literally got tired of talking about whether or not he made the right decision. Because in the middle of his um, press conference on Monday, Smith said, you know what? Let's just talk about the positive. And regardless of how you feel about the Houston Texans tie, and I keep wanting to say loss, but we kind of understand why. But regardless how you feel about yesterday's game, there was a lot of positives that you were able to take from that game. And one of the things that he talked about that really caught my attention was the debut of Jalen Petrie and Derek Stanley Jr. And he mentioned that, and John, you have the snap count, so you could correct me if I'm wrong, but um, both of those guys end up playing in the ballpark somewhere around 90 to 93 of the defensive snaps. 100% of the snaps at the end of the day. And Lovey Smith said that was not the initial plan. Yes, they was always going to allow them to play majority of the defensive snaps in that game. However, he said they really wanted to just use this game to see where both of those guys were. And the fact that both Petrie and Stingley played 100% of the defensive snaps on Sunday was a huge step forward for the Houston Texans. John, when I take a look at Jalen Petrie, you're talking about a guy who recorded 11 tackles on Sunday, which ended up being the second most in franchise history, trailing only DeMarco, De, DeMarcus Ryan from 2006 when he opened the D'Amico Ryan. Ryan in 2006 when he recorded 13 tackles in his debut. And in terms of Derek Stanley Jr., this is a guy who recorded seven tackles and one pass deflection. John, you know me. I've been talking a lot about the epic collapse that the Houston Texans had. When you take a look at the defensive side of the ball, once again, they gave up over 200 yards and when you go back and you take a look at their first three or first four possessions of the fourth quarter, they ended up scoring three times. Field goal, touchdown, touchdown. But Derek Stingley Jr. literally made one of, if not the most important play of the game, when he recorded a pass deflection, a touchdown pass deflection between Matt Ryan's and his attended target was rookie wide receiver Alex Pierce. I love what I saw out of both of those guys. And John when I take a look at where Stingley and Petrie is as of right now, it just lets me know, regardless how you feel about Sunday's game, that is one of, if not the biggest positive that you can take, that the Houston Texans have rookies that are ready to play and make an impact for this organization now. You know, sometimes, and I have a lot of respect, a lot of respect for Lovey Smith and his coaching staff uh, and the front office. Sometimes... Things are said that just confuses me. <laughs> uh, you had preseason. That's what preseason for. Why, why, why wouldn't they be out there? Well, for one, well, as, as a safety, there is no other. Who, who else is going to play safety for the – Eric Murray? You going to put Eric Murray out there outside of Jalen Petrie? Well, that's you? almost like the same conversation we had on the offensive side of the ball. Like, who else you going to have in the backfield? Rex Burkhead? And look how that turned out. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I mean, I get it. It was their very first game. I mean, you know, not only do you got to think about talent-wise and stuff, but you also got to think about, you know, the personal-wise. Like, you know, whether this moment might be too big or whatever the case what? might be. I see how you're looking at me, but these what? are things that people are thinking about. Well, the coaching staff is thinking about. Yeah, that's, you have those moments in three games in August. But once again, when you go back to the offensive side of the ball, we can make that same argument and look what they did. They went the complete opposite. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I, I'm going to keep it short and sweet because I disagree with that statement from Lovey Smith. I mean, uh, and, and here's the thing. And I'm going to mention Damian Pierce in this as well. You had the opportunity and time to get it all out the way in the preseason. Like, we had the conversation with Damian Pierce on whether or not he should have been – he should have played in that second game, and we saw enough from him. Well, then game one of the regular season come around, and we're talking about things that maybe you could have – found out in, in the preseason where he should have been playing to get better in live action. But I will say that on uh, Sunday, I was very impressed with Jalen Petrie. Um, I feel like that Derek Stingley was one of those can't miss prospects that it was either Derek Stingley or Sauce Gardner, who, by the way, Sauce Gardner had a very good game on Sunday. But it was out of those two, and everybody would be okay with it because they were the more NFL-ready prospect, right? Uh, Jalen Petrie, when he was drafted, now us here in Houston, 
and the local media understood how important it was to draft the safety. Maybe 37th overall was a little too high, but the moment he stepped in to be a Houston Texan, you know, he's been having nothing but good days, right? Some fixable and teachable moments, but overall, he's been the best safety on this on his roster. And on Sunday, I was more impressed with Jalen Petrie than I was with Derek Stingley. Derek Stingley absolutely plays the harder position. And I, I want to say that he gave up something along the lines of six catches for 80 something yards. Uh first game as a rookie. You know, you know, you can't be mad at that. Because he made some plays in the passing game, broke up a like you mentioned, broke up a, a touchdown with Pierce. But when I look at Jalen Petrie, one of the things that I was concerned for, in a sense, was how was he going to cover? Didn't get a lot of opportunities to, you know, break down whether or not he's good in coverage, but only allowed one catch for three yards. That is something that I think a lot of people should be happy for. So those two players, the DBs that Houston drafted, I thought that they did some very good things on Sunday. I thought that when you moved around Jalen Petrie to play how you can play him, that is what is going to allow him throughout his career to be effective and make those plays. And for Derek Stingley, and again, I think that he did some things as a cornerback that you can really use to kind of grow from. And then there's teaching moments. There's never not a teaching moment in the NFL. And he had some on Sunday. You just want him to get better. And then when you come back on next Sunday, kind of work on some of those things. Listen, if you haven't tried the Built Bar Puffs yet, you are you're kind of depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys when you think about snacks and healthy snacks at that. And guess what? There's a new flavor, the delicious indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. That's right. Bill Bar has done it again. Let me introduce you to the new and a favorite from a lot of people, the cookie dough chunk puff, super light, chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and, of course, covered in 100% chocolate. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, it's healthy for you. Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories, and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. You can't beat that. So go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKEDON15 and get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKEDON15. Thanks for making Locked On Texans your first listen today. Now make Locked On Fantasy Football your second listen. Find the intellectual fantasy expert, Vinny Iyer, who brings over 20 years of NFL expertise and a unique angle to give you the moves nobody else has. Get ready for your fantasy draft with Locked On Fantasy Football. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Tuesday installment of Locked On Texans. And, of course, the number one topic, the number one subject surrounding Lovey Smith's press conference on Monday was his decision to settle for a tie and not to go for it on fourth and third. And, of course, that was the number one topic in the city of Houston on yesterday, period. And Lovey Smith, after re-watching the game, after taking more notes, after having over 24 hours or close to 24 hours to think about it, he slept on it. The man said if he had an opportunity to do it again, do he it. would. Yeah. <laughs> Plain and simple. Um, John, you know, we can go back and forth on this. I already gave my, my I already sh- shared how I felt about the situation. I 100% supported him just given, like he said, following the game. The events that took place in the fourth quarter in overtime, it was just safer to leave the game and a tie rather than a loss. However, John, the one the, the one issue that keep plaguing my mind is the fact that, and I hate to bring this up, and this is no shot towards Davis Mills, but if the Texans had a better quarterback or a more established quarterback, let's say that, well, Lovey Smith had – would yes. have been more willing to go for it on fourth and third. Yes. So there was an opportunity before the third and one run by Rex Burkhead. Mm-hmm. Uh, so second and one. I know exactly where you're going. And uh, Davis Mills just completely missed. I want to say it was Brevin Jordan mm-hmm. out there. Was he in the flats or was it an out route? Either way, he missed a wide open Brevin Jordan. Now, this would have converted and you would have been able to, you know, get a first down, keep the drive going. 
keep that momentum going. So let's understand this. When the Texans opened up the overtime, they opened up trying to allow Davis Mills to go win it. Am I right or wrong? You're right. So there were some issues with that. They go down, they try to make some plays on defense. The coast, you know, driving downfield, miss field goal. We have an opportunity. And on second and one, there was miscommunication or just a bad read or just not anticipating the throw. Davis Mills just completely missed a wide open opportunity. Mm -hmm. That led to Rex Burkhead getting the ball on third and one, which led to negative two yards. Now we got to look at fourth and third. So I definitely believe that Davis Mills is going to have to play to earn the respect. And, of course, he's playing. He's a starting quarterback right now. But he's got to go out there, and he has to make some plays. There was a couple of times throughout the game where he didn't make the plays. He didn't make the the easy read, Hmm. which led to a sack here. And, again, I'm going to continue to say this. I've never seen anybody to run a 4-5 not run a 4-5. And what I'm saying by that is, if you guys look at Davis Mills, I want to say he ran a 4-5 or 4-6. We'll never see it because he refuses to run and use his legs to pick up those extra yardage. Sometimes he plays like a statue. So you take all of that into account. Now it's fourth and third. Do I trust Davis Mills to put the ball in his hand? Because you're not going to run the ball on fourth and third. Maybe fourth and one. You're not going to run it on fourth and third. Your quarterback is going to have to make a play. And at that point in the game, was there trust in Davis Mills? This is not for you homers. This is not for you cherry on top fans. We like Davis Mills here on this show. We have acknowledged that he has to go out there and win the starting job for his future. And that's okay. This is football. But at that point, you guys ask yourself, Cody, I'm going to let you ask you. I want you to answer too. Would you have trusted Davis Mills? With fourth and third with the game on the line? Not not at that moment, no. Not at that moment. But this is why I still disagree with that. You play to win the game. So, you don't play to, for a tie. You don't play to lose. You just know that unless you're like the Philadelphia 76ers when it was tanking uh, <laughs> or the Jacksonville Jaguars when it was tanking for Trevor Lawrence, you don't play to lose. You don't. And the NFL football is never a sport where people – play to lose you just happen to lose because you got outplayed that day or the the football guys was on your side you don't play to lose you don't play for a tie you play to win the game and as the head coach with decades of experience i expect for you to at least to set the tone at the beginning of the season to say if we don't look if we don't win we did everything we could not to lose the ball game I do wonder how much, and of course, this will be the last time we talk about this situation, guys. But, John, I do wonder how much this, the the possibility of losing this game, I do wonder whether or not Lovey Smith was afraid that if they would have went out with the epic collapse and lost this game in overtime, I wonder how much was he, was there a fear that that was going to, start this season off a bad on on a bad note and they would never recover from this because as i sat there and i watched the texans give up that big lead i just kept thinking about last year week five against the new england patriots and john you remember i came on this show and i said the season is done because every single one of those guys that we talked to talked to during the press conference even david cully the guys that we talked to off record, like the 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 little hope and, and and promise that the Texans did start the season off with, and of course, you know, a lot of people thought they was gonna go zero and seventeen, and because they they won against the Jacksonville Jaguars, and you you know they they was in it, I believe it was that they they they, they started to come back against the the Browns or something like now that. They were winning against the Browns, and then Tyrod yeah, Taylor got hurt. yeah, before Tyrod Taylor got hurt, yeah. So it was like. Because you had some momentum from those first two games, everybody was like, okay, maybe maybe this season won't be as bad as we think. But when they lost that game against the New England Patriots, every I knew at that moment the season was done. And when I sat there inside NRG Stadium and I looked at them blowing another lead, I said to myself, if they lose this, lose this game, it's going to set a bad tone for the entire season. And I went back to what John Grenard told us, I think it was either last Wednesday or last Thursday. 
this game was going to show us what we are working with for this entire season. And I and I'm wondering how much did that play into a factor? Because at the end of the day, even though he wasn't head coach, Lovey Smith was there as a defensive coordinator. Yeah, by your justification, I would say that maybe going for the tie will set the tone for the entire year. They're not going to be aggressive. They're going to be. They're going to be conservative. That too. And they're going to allow the game to maybe affect them more than they're affecting the game. I've just. I just I've, I've playing for the tie just for me and, and, and maybe it work, maybe it will work out for the Texans because as of right now they are technically the number one seed. Don't start uh, that. Player Don't in start the AFC that. South. Don't start that. Because nobody won <laughs> yesterday. Uh, so maybe it'll work out in their favor later in the season, but for me it's just like at the very least try. You know, maybe that's just me. Thank you guys for checking out today's episode of the Locked On Texan podcast. Be sure to check us out on YouTube under the name Locked On Texans. Follow us on Twitter at Locked On Texans as well. Follow me on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. Um, I may get a little bit more busier in them Texans, Texans Twitter streets with some spaces this week. I don't know. Have some fun. And as always, I'm your host, Cody Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody, C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. Only the Houston Texans can start the season off <laughs> this way. <laughs> zero, <laughs> zero, and one. Uh, not only the Colts. It could, you know, it could be worse. worse. You could be an Atlanta Falcon fan. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen. Peace.